My view of Shikantaza is that it's an evolution that it evolved from the Anapanasati practice, the Theravadan practice of Anapanasati. Anapanasati means breath awareness, so I call it breath awareness meditation. And in the tradition that I'm uh, in the lineage, the Theravadan lineage, we use one spot for the breath, which is called the Anapana region or spot, somewhere between the nostrils and the upper lip or the whole region would be the Anapana spot or Anapana region. And so we bring awareness to that area and we open to contact with the breath as it moves across the Anapana region. And uh, everything, this has made the priority over anything else in our experience. So we could be feeling a sore knee, we don't bring our awareness to the knee, we stay with the breath. And this allows us to deepen our concentration this is the first practice the Buddha taught people. And I had one scholar tell me this was one of his favorite practices on during the Wasa, the rains retreats that they do every year in Southeast Asia for uh, about three months. They go into monasteries and will practice indoors because of the monsoons. And this was apparently what the Buddha liked to do during that period. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what a scholar was telling me. Anyway, as Buddhism spread uh, from India to China in particular, it's my opinion that the teachers wanting to soften the striving of students, wanting to get somewhere, wanting to get jhana, relaxed some of the instructions and some of the landmarks of the practice. Wanting to have people practice but to go in and open up in a way to the vastness of uh, the absolute. And I think over time, a lot of the instructions and the progression was lost. When I began practicing Zen in 1976, they would spend, uh, they being the teachers, would spend an extensive amount of time showing us the proper posture for the body how to hold ourselves, how our robes should be, uh, all the exterior things we should be doing. And we were taught in those days, you didn't move for the whole sitting, you didn't change posture, uh, you just stayed in that spot. In those days they would use what was called a kilosaku or a kaisaku, which is, means awakening stick. And it's this long, maybe one meter, three feet long, flat stick, and if somebody were falling asleep or their posture was off, there was a monitor who would, would be carrying that around who would uh, whack them on the meaty part of the sh shoulder near the neck. Uh, it doesn't actually hurt when that happens. It's very loud. It's a flat stick, so it makes a loud clapping noise. But if someone is actually pretty clean in terms of their energy, it can not only feel good, it could really release a lot of the tension or pain in the back. And anyway, that's mostly been discontinued in the West for obvious reasons. But, but part of my point on that is just that there, there was no instruction on the internal process of Shikantaza. And I went and asked a lot of the more senior monastics and lay people, what are you doing when you're meditating? And really every person gave me a different answer. And that's when I realized that they really didn't know what they were doing. They were sitting and just letting it all happen. But the one constant was that we were learning to sit and continue our meditation despite pain. And that was really the point of the practice was to break down resistances and to teach us how to stay with our experience despite the personal pain we could be in, whether emotional psychological or physical. So when I began to understand that there was a relationship between Anapanasati and Shikantaza, then I began looking at the progression of the Anapanasati. What do I, what do I see both in myself and the students? I've been teaching this for about 17 years. And I saw that there were these stages that people would go through. They weren't articulated. And in practicing Shikantaza, I could find the same stages. 
So that was when I began teaching the Shikantaza with having three stages. The first stage is the union of body and mind. And body and mind are already, already in a unity. If there's any division, it's a conceptual division. It's a thought division. Most people, if you stop someone on the street and said, where's your mind, they would point to their head. Whereas your body, they would point to the rest of them, the trunk and the limbs. And so the, if there is a division, for most people, it's around the neck. And it's important to recall, remember, that the division is conceptual only. There really is no division between body and mind. How can there be? And so part of our practicing, if we're finding a division, is we sit with body, mind, and the division. We don't do anything, there's no technique. Simply by bringing awareness to body, mind, and separation, the separation will begin to soften. That's because it's conceptual. It's not a reality. So that's why it can't be maintained if we're not maintaining the concept. So when we get the experience of the union of body and mind, some people feel it as a flow, some just feel it as a kind of unified uh, experience, then that's the first stage of union of body and mind. And then taking that union of body and mind as inner, we then begin to make contact with outer. Normally the outer and inner division is the body boundary, so the skin. And this, you'll recall, comes from early in our life when we are born into the dual unity, the, the oneness with presence and love of the Absolute. And we see everything as an expression of this presence and love. But at some point we begin to recognize hunger and needs are in, they're inside the skin, and satisfaction or relief is outside. And that begins to establish the concept of body boundary and me, begins the workings of me, our physicality. So in the second stage, we then open awareness to what's inner, what's outer, and noticing the body boundary, if there is an inner and outer, that means there's a separation. So we're holding all of that in awareness as one. And with deepening concentration, over time, the body boundary will begin to soften. We'll have the experience where I can't feel my left arm, I can't feel my, my head's missing, I can't feel the upper part of my body. So we'll have, we'll have a, um, a sense of the body being different than our normal perception, or we can't feel it substantially. So that's the loss of body boundary, which is the unity of inner and outer. Again, they're already unified. Inner and outer are the same. We're just letting the concept of body boundary soften and drop. And whenever the body boundary is significantly missing, now it doesn't mean if you have a little spot that's, you know, a few, a few inches in size that we want to bring our awareness there. We want to wait for a significant amount of the body to be gone, meaning the head's gone, the upper body, the left side. And some, some people feel the body boundary relaxing as a kind of, um, uh, I'm not sure how to phrase it, but it's like they're, they'll feel like their left arm is uh, three meters away, three yards away from where they are. Uh, even though on one level they physically know it's not possible, that's the inner sensation. So that right there is showing the body boundary is collapsing because we're no longer this intact body in this specific location. So as the body boundary drops sufficiently and inner and outer, we can feel the union of those, the sameness of those, then we bring our awareness to where the body boundary is not and where the union of inner and outer is abiding. And then that's stage two of Shikantaza. And then we open to the void, the vastness, the spaciousness that's always here. And that's stage three of Shikantaza. And then we begin opening up 
and just being aware of what's in our perception, our awareness, and moving on from there. <laughs>